Well, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, I think probably everyone on this uh, on this uh, Zoom uh, meeting knows that the Arctic is quickly losing its sea ice cover, especially uh, at the end of summer. And a lot of that information comes from the satellite passive microwave record. Now we maintain those records right here at the National Snow and Ice Data Center. Thousands of scientists around the world use these data. And of course we do a lot of our own sea ice research right here at NSIDC. And uh, as I think you also know, that because of all we do, that National Snow and Ice Data Center is the most trusted name in sea ice. Now, one of the reasons we are so trusted is we have scientists like Walt Meyer of NSIDC who has spent many years looking at this passive microwave record, uh, looking at all the things that affect the trends that we see, the variability that we see, uh, sea ice concentrations that we, that we see, uh, it's really quite a complicated issue because we have different algorithms, different data sets, et cetera. But Walt knows all about it. And so today we're going to hear from Walt Meyer himself on a comparison of long-term sea ice extent and area trends from three NSIDC passive microwave sea ice products. Walt, take it away. All right, thank you, Mark, for that great introduction. Very nice and kind introduction and um, apologies for the rather verbose title. <laughs> um, but uh, let me jump into here, into this. Um, let me just, uh, yeah, there are some folks from outside NSIDC, I'm sure joining. Um, so I'm just gonna introduce very briefly here the National Snow and Ice Data for those who aren't, data center for those who aren't familiar. Um, we're part of the Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Sciences within the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, and you know, we focus on managing and distributing scientific data, as well as conducting research and supporting data users and providing tools to help users with data access. We also have a very active uh, group that supports local and traditional knowledge um, and, uh, and, and accumulates data and, and research on, on that. And we uh, educate the public about the cryosphere too um, and provide a lot of educational materials. Um, and our, our sponsors, main sponsors are NASA, NOAA, and NSF, and I'll get into that shortly. Um, you know, first, um, one of our biggest projects here uh, that I'm uh, primarily supported through is, is the DAC, which is the Distributed Active Archive Center, which is uh, the NASA Snow and Ice Data Center um, that we host here at NSIDC that archives the NASA products, primarily satellite, but also airborne and field products. And uh, the passive microwave products are going to be a, a major focus of this uh, of this talk. Um, another big program that we have here as well is NOAA, uh, the NOAA uh, data center at, at NSIDC that archives NOAA cryosphere products. Um, and NOAA focuses a lot on historical products, data recovery, um, old ice charts, and digitizing data. For example, uh, one of the things we they have is uh, the the sea ice back to 1850 um, from old ice charts, um, in situ and field data, operational products um, from operational ice charting centers like the US National Ice Center. And then uh, other data such as uh, Department of Defense data, uh, for example, submarine data as part of the SIZEX experiment. Um, and NOAA also uh, it contributes to the passive microwave data, which I'll describe again uh, briefly or, or shortly here. Um, so uh, first, let me just give uh, some background on passive microwave uh, remote sensing and, and some of the sensors first here. These are satellite-borne sensors. Um, this is kind of just for the record. I won't read through all of these because it gets quite wordy. Uh, a lot of microwave, a lot of radiometer words here. Um, but the three kind of in the middle there highlighted are the three that form the long-term time series that we have um, at NSIDC and the products that we have. And so those, that's what I'm gonna focus on in this talk. Um, these are either NASA or US Defense Department satellites and, and sensors. Um, and so looking at these, um, we have a, a record that goes back really starting our earliest sensor, the ESMER starting in about 1972, but our continuous and multi-channel record 
um, is starts with Simmer in uh, late October of 1978. And these are a continuous series of satellites um, that we have at least one going at, at a time um, with overlap between sensors since then um, and continuing to the present. Um, so this gives us a long climate record. Um, I think I missed something here. Oh, this. Sorry about that. <laughs> I must have hit the button twice. I knew I wanted to get this. This actually fits in well here anyways. Um, one of the reasons why we use passive microwave remote sensing for sea ice uh, it has particular advantages. Um, it has all sky capability. Um, it's measuring the emission from the Earth's surface. So it doesn't require sunlight. And that emission is not particularly affected by clouds. So it has all sky capability. Um, we have complete daily coverage, except for a, an area near the pole um, in the Arctic where the sensor uh, characteristics and satellite orbit, um, it doesn't reach that area. So, um, I don't know what that was. Um, folks saw that. And it gives us this long-term record. Since I, I say 1979, that the first satellite, like I said, was launched in late 1978, but 79 marks kind of the first full year of data um, it, it, where we're tracking. So a lot of times uh, the analyses, including what I'll talk about here, starts in 1979. Um, and they're largely consistent sensor characteristics, the frequencies, the spatial resolution, the satellite orbits, are not exactly the same, but, but quite close and allows us to um, do a consistent record and that provides a valuable climate record. Now there are limitations and disadvantages to passive microwaves. The, the primary one being it's low spatial resolution, meaning it has a large sensor footprint. So our data is on generally 25 kilometer grid cell resolution, um, but the footprint size is even larger than that often. So the effective resolution is even lower. So we're seeing details in the ice cover, we're seeing kind of the big picture course resolution, um, which is very useful for a climate record, um, but uh, it's not uh, very good for, for example, for operational use for supporting ships in the region, because it's just not, um, doesn't have that fine scale resolution. It also doesn't perform all that well in certain care, in certain uh, types of ice conditions, um, namely thin ice um, that tends to be underestimated and melting ice. The surface melt uh, is misinterpreted by the, the sensor um, as, as lower concentration. And there also can be uh, weather effects um, that, that um, can affect the, uh, the sensor. Like I said, clouds generally don't affect it, but if you have um, very thick clouds, painting clouds, as well as winds roughening the ocean, um, those can affect the uh, the retrieval and give you some false retrievals. We do have filters that are applied to, to remove that, but they're not 100% effective. Um, and then there's also, because of the low resolution, we get areas where ice-free uh, water, ice-free ocean and land are within the same footprint. And, and that gives you a mixed uh, signal um, a, a kind of an average between those two signals within the satellite footprint, sensor footprint. And unfortunately, that looks a lot like sea ice to the, uh, to the algorithms. And so you can get kind of a rim of ice along the coast that isn't realistic. There's a filter for that as well, but again, it's not 100% effective. Um, so these, uh, you know, these limitations, like I said, make it very limited for operational use. Um, it's really focused on the long-term climate record and looking at changes in the climate. So um, I went through these and showing those. Um, so just a uh, background and apologies for folks that are already familiar with passive microwave remote sensing. Um, I'll, I'll go through this pretty quickly, but just for, for background for people who may not be as familiar, uh, what, what the microwave sensors are, are measuring is the, is the emission from the earth in the microwave range um, and for sea ice, what we use is between 18 and 37 gigahertz. Some, uh, some, some products uh, and some applications use the 90 gigahertz or near 90 gigahertz as well. But what it measures, the data that we get, the data values that we get are uh, what we call brightness temperatures or TB. Um, and that effectively is, is a way, it's, it's a simple way of, of getting the emission and the energy emitted in the microwave range at those frequencies. Um, and it's it's a really simple equation um, with uh, with the various assumptions and, and so forth. It's just this emissivity factor times the uh, physical temperature, the actual what you'd measure with the thermometer, and the emissivity kind of 
bundles up all the uh, the complicated stuff about the properties of the emitting materials, such as salinity, um, the phase of the of the uh, phase of water, whether it's frozen or liquid. And uh, this image just gives it a, a simple example. This is at 19 gigahertz, and you can see um, you know the the dark colors uh, within the ocean, which are near 100 Kelvin uh, in terms of brightness temperature is the water and there's a pretty strong contrast there with the ice which is more in the 200 to 250 range um, 250 Kelvin range and so you can you can really pretty distinctly see the uh, the ice cover there um, in the ocean and again you don't see much cloud effect um, you get a complete picture of the Arctic there um, you can also look at the polarization. Uh, microwaves get emitted in preferential directions depending on the medium. Um, and the polarization um, can provide uh, further uh, discrimination um, in, the, uh, in, in different directions. And, and the data gets uh, kind of put into perpendicular, transformed into perpendicular directions, horizontal and vertical. And, um, and if you uh, if you look at the uh, a map of just the difference in polarization, the water is much more polarized. There's a bigger difference between the vertical and horizontal polarization. It's lighter colored here, um, whereas the ice is pretty unpolarized, so it's roughly equal in the different polarizations. So that also helps us discriminate things, um, as I as I point out here. So um, now taking those brightness temperatures and, and converting them to a geophysical parameter, what we call sea ice concentration um, or fractional coverage in a grid cell from the source brightness temperature requires an algorithm. Um, and there have been several algorithms that have been developed over the years. And they use different combinations of channels uh, in, the, in, the, in the data, polarization and frequency, as well as different methodologies, different ways of combining these, these different channels. And they're basically empirically derived. Um, it's just looking at the data, like I show those images, you can pretty clearly see just uh, subjectively um, the difference where, where the ice is and where the ocean is. And so we can look at that and derive um, a, an algorithm based on that data. And two uh, kind of canonical um, early algorithms that were, were uh, developed in, uh, at, at NASA Goddard back in the 1980s um, and these data products are archived now at the, at the, and have been for many years at the NSIDC uh, DAC. It's the NASA team algorithm and the bootstrap algorithm. Um, and I'll just briefly, these are the two I'm gonna look at and show today. Um, and I'm gonna just briefly go through these. The NASA team uses brightness temperature ratios, one called the polarization ratio, which is 18 gigahertz or 19 gigahertz. Um, uh, vertical and horizontal difference uh, in the polarization, and then the gradient ratio, which is basically 37 or 36 gigahertz difference at the vertical polarization with, with the 18 or 19. Um, and those both kind of highlight differences between water and ice or between different types of ice. Um, MYI is multi-year ice uh, versus first-year ice for FYI. Um, if you plot these up, if you just kind of take some data, this is just from one day, um, an example, but you see this pretty typically, what you get is this kind of interesting triangle pattern. You get a cluster on one vertice um, over on the right, kind of the upper right, that corresponds with, with water, with 0% ice, and another kind of cluster along a line um, over on the, on the left, and that corresponds to ice, 100% ice, and different ice types, first year or multi-year. And so you can kind of draw a triangle, and this is basically what the NASA team algorithm does, is it just uh, calculates these vertices, it, it derives these vertices of the triangle to, to calculate pure ice types, uh, to represent pure ice types. And then you just are basically finding where you're at within the triangle um, to get your concentration. Now, there are, there are dots that fall outside that triangle, um, especially in the 0% um, ice area. That's, that's kind of the noise, weather, and other effects that, that uh, play a role. And the weather effects particularly play a role, the ocean roughening of the surface or, or uh, emission of the atmosphere over, over the water. Um, and so that's why you get that big scatter there. So what we, what, what we do there is apply a weather filter. We just do a cutoff to uh, call it ice-free above a certain level 
like a gradient ratio level of 0 0.05 here. Um, and so that removes all that noise or a good part of that noise anyways. Now the bootstrap algorithm does something similar. It does a cluster analysis essentially, but it, it uses um, different combinations of channels. It doesn't do a polarization difference. Here's an example where it just uses the 19 gigahertz and 37 gigahertz at the vertical polarization. And again, you get a cluster around a 0% ice again with some noise and there's a weather filter applied for that as well um, and then along a line the red there where it's 100 percent ice and again you can just interpolate between that to get your your actual concentration um, so just the the processing that's done for our for the products here and these are the DAC and uh, NSIDC NASA DAC products um, there's gridded brightness temperatures um, that are processed at NSIDC and then we have two kind of different uh, streams. One um, is a near real time, which we process here in house at the top, but the other is actually processed at NASA Goddard by the scientists at NASA Goddard. Um, they run the algorithms themselves there, taking the input brightness temperatures, um, run the weather filters and the spillover correction and, and other automated um, processes. But then they also do a manual quality control step where they look at the data, and manually, um, if there's bad weather data, if there's potentially um, coastal data that's that's erroneous, um, they will look at that um, and remove that manually um, and remove those errors. And, and this is done um, using their expert uh, judgment, um, but it is subjective and it also is not uh, tracked. So um, it gives you a cleaner, uh, I would say probably you're more accurate, remove some of the errors uh, but it, it doesn't uh, give you the, uh, it doesn't fully track the processing that's done. And I'll note also, you see there are two parallel streams, the NASA team and the bootstrap, they're done by different scientists at NASA Goddard and they're done independently. So the menu QC is gonna be different between the two of them. Um, now, uh, moving on to the third product, is the sea ice concentration data record. Um, that's This is sponsored by and funded by the NOAA Climate Data Record Program. And this is really focused on you know, a long-term consistent uh, tr climate tracking, climate change and variability um, products. And it's, it's focused on transparency, reproducibility and provenance. So being what, what is really qualifies as a climate data record, not just a long-term record, but something that is reproduced that, that has full documentation and provenance. And so all the processing must be tracked from the source data to the final product. Um, so the NASA products that come from NASA Goddard do not meet the, this criteria. Um, Another thing that's that's kind of part of the uh, the CDR that's one thing that's aimed for is uncertainty estimates as well, and and that is something um, that is very useful in the use of the data, but also is not directly produced by 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 NASA Goddard. And the CIS climate direct data record first uh, came out in 2013, um, and has been updated since then. Um, the first versions did not include the early part of the record, the SIMR um, sensor. Um, that goes from, like I said, late October 1978 to August 1987. So that, that was an unfortunate gap, um, but SIMR uh, was a challenge to work with. Um, and and uh, this was um, working with scientists at NASA Goddard. Um, they, they said the same thing when they created the products. Um, it required a lot of uh, kind of uh, attention um, and, 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 and kind of uh, improving, looking to try to improve the the quality of the data, um, manual corrections. Um, you know, Simmer is kind of like uh, you know uh, the 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 kid, you know, one of your children that you know is overly active and and uh, you know goes through those phases where uh, they're just kind of troublesome. Um, so you you call a you know you call call them a, a challenge. <laughs> um, so Simmer is like that. Um, and uh, so when the versions the CDR first came out we didn't have the, the CDR parameter for that period. And we filled that in using the Goddard products to fill that period in. But again, uh, you know, that doesn't really meet the CDR criteria. Um, so the goal uh, was always to try to eventually fill that in. And we actually did that 
um, with version four, which was released this past June, um, added the SIMR data to the CDR. Um, and that again was fully, uh, the processing is all automated um, and, and fully transparent. There is no manual QC in the SIMR. Um, it did uh, result in some more data gaps um, than what we get from later data but we uh, implemented spatial and temporal interpolation to fill as many of those data gaps as we could um, and also enhance some automated quality control to try to, uh, to at least address some of the, uh, the, as much as we could of the, the errors that um, don't get corrected if you don't do manual quality control. And I think we, we have a pretty good product, a very good product uh, given that, um, it, that gives you high quality data uh, as well as fully uh, automated processing. Um, so the, the CDR product is um, using the NASA team and bootstrap algorithms. Um, there's no real new algorithm within the CDR, um, but what it does is it combines the two of them together and it selects the CIS concentration um, between either one of the two, NASA team or bootstrap. And one of the things that's been found over the years uh, repeatedly is that the passive microwave often tends to, often tends to um, underestimate concentration in most situations, um, particularly during melt. Um, you get melt water on the ice, as I talked about, and uh, the melt water is seen as open water, is reduced concentration. And so, um, the concentration tends to be lower. And so if you are looking at the NASA team and the bootstrap, you wanna probably select the higher one is most likely to be act more accurate. This isn't always the case. Um, near the ice edge, for example, um, you can get differences where the concentration might be overestimated and, and therefore um, you might get some ambiguity there. Um, and, and that causes some issues if you're looking at combining the NASA team and the bootstrap. So we decided to, um, just use the bootstrap uh, ice edge uh, using a 15% contour, which is commonly used to define the ice edge. Um, and, and that avoids some ambiguity at the ice edge and makes things more consistent. But within the ice pack, um, we use the higher concentration. Um, we also calculate relative uncertainty estimates based on the spatial variation of the grids, of, of surrounding grid cells in the NASA team and bootstrap concentrations. I'm not gonna go into that today. Um, we did do um, spatial interpolation of scattered missing cells at the brightness temperature level. This is uh, basically the same thing that NASA Goddard did with their products as well, um, with the DAC products. And then in a temporal interpolation to fill in larger missing areas if there's missing swaths or missing, uh, missing days of data. Um, NASA Goddard did, the, did this as well but we did this, uh, the CDR is done independently and slightly differently the way it uses the different days to fill. Um, another thing is, I didn't mention before, SIMR operated only every other day um, and only got data from every other day, not daily like the later data. Um, and uh, from users, one of the things that we often heard was the desire to have complete daily fields and have data for every, every day. So we did use this in temporal interpolation to, to fill in the missing days. So now there is data every day in SIMR, uh, which is not done in the Goddard fields. Um, there is still some scattered missing data and there are periods with missing data um, that, that exists, but it, it's much more complete than uh, what, what used to exist. And then uh, the weather filters and spillover correction, this land coast uh, mixed grid cell issue, um, NASA team and bootstrap do these independently and use different methods and have different effectiveness. So that's okay. Uh, it, it works fine with each individual one and they do the manual corrections to kind of clean up what's left. Um, what we did for the CDR was to apply both of those to be a little more aggressive in this to try to remove as much um, of this, of these effects as possible automatically because we're not doing the manual corrections. So um, comparing these, uh, what I'm gonna kind of focus here the rest of the talk is to, to compare the three of these. How do, how do they compare and, and particularly compare in terms of their trends and, and, and sea ice extent and area. Um, and, and these are what are commonly used as the, the main climate indicators to track climate change and sea ice change. Um, they're used in, in a wide variety of uh, assessments and annual reports. Um, 
We report these uh, from the NASA team and the Arctic Sea Ice News and Analysis, which is a NASA project at NSIDC. Um, and um, you know, we look at the we look at the trend uncertainties, in, in, um, and these are based for each individual product on on the linear fit, uh, the trend standard deviation, looking for trend significance. That's typically what is used um, to to kind of assess the uncertainty. But really, there's there's uncertainty from the algorithms themselves. It's not just the linear fit. So when we talk about trend uncertainties. Um, based on linear fit, we're not really accounting for the the true uncertainty in these trends, um, and that can be an issue. So um, the comparisons here, uh, looking at concentration differences, uh, I'll just briefly show, and then extent and area. Now extent is the area, total area covered by at least 15% ice, and then area we, we weight by concentration. So area takes into account concentration, whereas extent is just ice or no ice. Um, it's just where it's greater than 15%, it's ice. If it's less than 15%, it's, it's water. So comparing concentration, um, this is the Northern Hemisphere. Um, on the left, the left four plots or four figures are, um, this is the, the CDR field minus the bootstrap on the far left and then the NASA team next to it um, for 1985. And then the same figures on the right, the four figures on the right, for 2020, so I'm just showing two years as an example. One of the earlier years, and then and then um, the, the more recent year. And the thing that sticks out here is that the bootstrap and the CDR are very close to zero differences, a little bit along the the, the ice edge, um, whereas the NASA team has much bigger differences, especially in summer, um, but even in winter near the ice edge, um, you know, 25 percent um, differences in um, and concentration, quite different. And this is not surprising, actually. This is something that we've seen. Um, the NASA team um, is, is more affected by the melt. It uses constant um, coefficients for, for the ice. Um, and when you get melt, um, it's gonna underestimate the concentration where the bootstrap um, uses dynamic tie points that adjust or dynamic coefficients. So they'll adjust for the different ice conditions. So um, the 100% the ice can be adjusted based on the melt to at least to some degree. And so what happens, um, the climate data record, like I said, uses the higher of the two concentrations. So it tends to use the bootstrap more often than the NASA team, and particularly in summer. So the climate data record, the CDR is much closer to the bootstrap um, compared to the NASA team. And we see this um, as well in the Antarctic, um, another thing that the NASA team is not as optimized for the Antarctic conditions. So we see, again, much larger differences um, with the NASA team compared to the CDR versus the bootstrap. Um, and again, this is uh, many, many comparisons have shown this through the years. So this isn't too surprising. Um, so, you know, looking at concentration or area, which uses concentration within it, is, is, has always been seen as somewhat problemat problematic with NASA team. Um, but extent, um, which is just looking at the uh, area covered greater than 15%, um, is less of an issue because you're just looking at, at, at the threshold. And so NASA team um, and bootstrap uh, will get different answers in the CDR, but um, the, uh, the trends are, are, have been seen to be fairly consistent between them. And we do see this. Um, this is looking at extent um, these are monthly averages plotted from 1979 through 2020. Um, kind, of, kind of a busy plot. The top is the actual uh, actual extent values. You can see the seasonal cycle up and down for summer and, and winter. The Southern Hemisphere, the Antarctic has a, a, a stronger seasonal cycle. Um, you can kind of see if you look closely that the blue and the red kind of stick out a little bit from each other. Um, so the bootstrap and NASA team are distinguished. The CDR in gray, actually, it's very hard to see um, because the CDR and the bootstrap basically overlay each other. Um, they're quite close. Um, but if we separate out the, um, the differences, um, you can see now you see differences uh, a little more clearly um, uh, between the bootstrap and the NASA team. And again, there's differences, but the, the NASA team and the bootstrap are, are not too much different um, except during like the summertime. And one of the things that, that if you look closely, um, I, I see this when I look at this, 
Um, but you see a little bit of discontinuity, uh, particularly in the NASA team in red, um, when you go from SIMR to, to SSMI to SSMIS. And, and that's this sensor intercalibration. When you change sensors, you do have to make adjustments to that. Um, and different the different groups, these are done, these were done, these adjustments were done at NASA Goddard, and the two different groups, the NASA team group and the bootstrap group, do these independently. And so you do see some some uh, differences between these products that you don't see this very much between the CDR and the bootstrap. Um, because again, it's following the bootstrap more closely. Um, and, but particularly the simmer part of the record, if you look over on the Southern hemisphere, I, I don't delineate, but you can kind of again change from simmer to the SSMI and SSMIS. And that's because simmer is a, is a more different sensor and had more issues, like I said. Um, but these do uh, affect, you know, if you look at trends, you will, you will see some of this. Um, and so looking at the extent trends, um, this is in percent per decade relative to the 1981 to 2010 average, the average for the climate data record. Um, I use that for consistency. Um, lots of numbers here, um, which I apologize for. Um, but if you look, just look kind of, if you can see my cursor, you're just like looking, this is all months um, for the for the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah, you know, they're they're fairly close. They're within a you know less than half a percent per decade, um, with the bootstrap and CDR being closer. The the bold uh, type indicates statistical significance at the ninety five percent level, um, and all the trends from all three of them are all statistically significant, quite strongly in the northern hemisphere, not at all in the southern hemisphere. And I also show the March and September March being the period of maximum in the in the northern hemisphere and near minimum in the southern hemisphere um, and then September being the minimum in the northern hemisphere and the maximum in the southern hemisphere and then also showing the difference the trend in the differences here um, and so the you know the the they're fairly small but they do end up being um, somewhat statistically significant um, if you look at just the uh, the trend if you just do a significance test um, and so that's saying that, that you know the, the differences are due to some differences in in the uh, specific algorithms and the products, um, not just random chance. Um, and and they're generally here negative, um, at least here. Which you know this is the CDR minus the bootstrap or CDR minus the NASA team. Um, and so it's negative. It means you know the CDR has a stronger negative trend um, in the northern hemisphere. Um, and in the Southern Hemisphere, at least for the, the bootstrap, it has a stronger or, or a, weak, uh, a, a stronger increasing trend or a, or a weaker increasing trend than in the NASA team compared to the NASA team. So um, moving on, looking at the area, again, doing the same thing. And again, this is, this is kind of, a, this is accounting for concentration. It's weighting everything by concentration. And the differences are, are more evident here between the bootstrap and the NASA team. Uh, particularly the the blue peaks of the blue trap stick out much more um, in the in this in, in the area um, and uh, the CDR again follows the blue trap so it's not really particularly visible um, and then if we look at the differences on the bottom um, the bootstrap follows quite closely, but in the northern hemisphere, there's a there's a clear bias, as well as in the southern hemisphere, and there's a, a really a strong seasonal cycle in the bias um, between the NASA team and the and the CDR here. So the differences are quite large. Um, there is some difference uh, again. Looking here in in D, um, you can see some differences in the um, in the bootstrap and CDR with the simmer um, that kind of goes away. Oops. Um, and again, that's that sensor transition in the, in the simmer data uh, and the troublesome issues there and, and the challenges using simmer, um, but it's still relatively small overall. And uh, looking at the area trends, you get pretty much similar, similar type of characteristics um, with the NASA team showing larger differences, especially here um, in September. Um, in the northern hemisphere, quite substantial differences where the, the NASA team is, is much lower uh, change there um, relative to a much lower in magnitude decreasing trend. But again, northern hemisphere is all statistically significant, whereas the southern hemisphere um, is, is not in terms of the trends. All right, so that's looking just at the hemispheric data, um, the hemispheric trends. 
Um, but I wanted to look at the different regions because analyzing the trends across the regions can give us, you know, look at the variability within uh, at some hemisphere scales and also potentially yield some insights into the algorithm's performances, performance. And um, there have been regional maps that have been around, um, but for this um, and, and looking towards the future, um, we uh, created uh, updated regional maps, and I'll, I'll go through that here short, briefly here. Um, there, there's kind of a long history of these that have developed over time. Uh, way back in the 1980s, um, NASA Goddard, Claire Parkinson, and others there developed an initial map for looking at uh, ESMER data. This is the early 1970s data, um, and this is from their sea ice atlas the ESMER Sea Ice Atlas um, that was published uh, way back in 1987. And then they adapted that for the SIMR and SSMI time series, added some regions and, and extended it, extended the, uh, the, the map outward. Um, and then um, in a paper that I and others did, um, decided to look at regions within the Arctic Ocean um, and the coastal seas. So things like the Beaufort Sea and the Chukchi Sea. So it took that central, the central Arctic region um, in the, the kind of the pale green and then split it into these sub-regions. And then um, there was an operational NOAA product, um, Maisie product um, that wanted to use these as well. And that was then adapted from, from these, from, from the, uh, the, the Meyer 2007 uh, product, but it was done um, manually in, in uh, GIS, uh, manually creating shape files and drawing polygons um, that roughly uh, estimate um, the, 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 the regions, but aren't exact. Um, and that's the thing with these maps, They're, they were kind of created ad hoc, especially the, the Meyer um, regional seas within the Arctic. Um, those were drawn um, just kind of roughly uh, estimated and, and kind of uh, ad hoc drawing the northern boundary in particular. Um, and they were derived um, on the polar stereo uh, 25 kilometer grid. So they're really valid only for those. You can obviously reproject um, and regrid those if one wants, but that they were defined on that grid. So for this, we want to do uh, a, a little more uh, kind of, uh, you know, objective way of doing this and, uh, and using more authoritative sources. And I want to give uh, Scott Stewart credit for this because he worked with me on this and, and did a lot of the, the work on this um, to, uh, to develop this. So we look for uh, a source here as an initial guide. And uh, the International Hydrographic Organization has a, uh, has a document, uh, Limits of Oceans and Seas, um, that uh, provides a guide for how you define the different seeds. Um, we looked at this and, and it provided a lot of good um, kind of waypoints and, and control points for in, in the specific boundaries um, for these seeds, but um, some of them were not very useful for sea ice um, and, and were quite different than what we've used in the past. So we kind of balanced this versus uh, versus the history of the previous in, uh, mass and maps and the utility for sea ice. Um, for example, the Beaufort Sea and the Chukchi Sea are quite small comparatively um, and not really indicative of sea ice and not useful for sea ice. So we changed those, for example. Um, and what we did is created the map in, in lat long space as a GIS shapefile, as our base map. Um, and that allows it to be adaptable to any grid. And we also uh, overlapped the regions onto land. So what you need to do is, you know, overlay a land mass with it, but it allows flexibility to use with different grids, different resolutions, or different land mass that might have slight differences, avoid kind of small inconsistencies near the coastline. So here's the, here's the new regional map. Um, and uh, the, the Antarctic we also did, uh, again, in GIS, although the, the definitions didn't change. These are just longitudinal um, boundaries there. Um, so um, now looking at the trends uh, with those, this is just the summary of the trends over the, the full time series for the different regions, uh, except for the regions in the far periphery uh, in, the, in the Northern hemisphere, which don't get much ice and, and um, don't really give us very good trends. Um, but these are the different regions. Um, and again, you can see here, this is extent um, and the different colors are 
for the corresponding to the different regions. And then the it's a little hard to see the gray, uh, the gray bars. Uh, that's the two standard deviation range to give you a sense of the, the significance. Um, and again, uh, you know, they're all statistically significant. And then the little uh, hashed um, blue and red are the, the differences in the trends between CDR and bootstrap or CDR and nasatine uh, for those for those regions. And generally, you see they're they're fairly small, um, and small compared to the overall trend. So again, there there are some differences there, but the trends are are pretty robust, um, even if you look at the different um, the different products. Um, if we look at the area, um, you say you see similar things. There's a couple areas: the Hudson Bay, um, this the the uncertainty, the trend uh, standard deviation, I should say. Um, does extend across the, the zero line just slightly, so does the bearing, which suggests that it's not quite statistically significant in those regions. Um, although this is looking at the full time series, um, looking at different or different seasons, um, does give you some statistical significance in some seasons. Um, again, you know, pretty pretty similar uh, results for extent. The one area that's that's quite different that kind of sticks out. Um, is this Central Arctic where the NASA team is actually the difference between the CDR and the NASA team is positive. Um, and what that indicates is that um, the, you know, the, the CDR trend is um, decreasing. It, it, it's actually weaker um, than the NASA team. So the NASA team is stronger, has a stronger trend. Um, and that suggests that perhaps there's a, an effect of melt. Um, and this has been talked about um, in the past, where uh, if you are if you are using uh, static tie points and there's more there's more melt, then the NASA team is going to become biased more, and the concentration is going to become biased, which is going to bias your area, um, and then that could could affect the trend that you get because if there's less melt early in the record versus later in the record, um, you may uh, impart a trend that's due to the surface melt, not due to the actual change in the area. And I think that is indicated here with this difference in the, uh, in the NASA team and CDR uh, trend difference. Um, the Southern Hemisphere is uh, quite a bit different. Um, none of the trends are statistically significant in any of the regions. Um, most of them are positive, although much smaller. Um, I'll, I'll note here the scale is quite a bit different um, between the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and then the trend uh, differences are quite large. They're almost on the scale, roughly on the scale, at least the same order of magnitude as the actual trends themselves. Um, and so, you know, that's suggesting that the, the differences in the algorithm, the different algorithms are giving you a, quite a bit different um, trends. Some of that is just simply that the trends are small um, and near zero. And so um, these small differences in the different algorithms and how the trends come out between those uh, does affect your southern hemisphere uh, extent as well, uh, or extent, but not as much with your area. Uh, which is interesting. And so the concentrations are, are, are playing a big role. It's really the, um, the ice edge in this. And the thing with the Southern Hemisphere, you have a big ice edge around the entire perimeter in winter, especially. And so small differences in where your ice edge is and have a big differences and big difference in extent, um, but maybe not as much in area. Um, and so that's quite interesting. One of the things that I think plays a role here is the different quality control. Um, like I said, we use both NASA team and bootstrap weather filters, um, and that affects your ice edge uh, detection as well. Um, and so I think what happens is the fact that we're using both of those gives us differences between the individual algorithms at the ice edge, which is playing into the extent and the extent trends. So. Um, you know I'm running out of time here. Um, you know, so just to finish up and summarize, um, you know, they're they're generally compared. They tell the same story, especially in the in the northern hemisphere in the Arctic. Um, there is a concentration bias evident again, especially in the Antarctic. But we do see that the satellite near calibration plays a role in the Terran differences. And really what that's saying is that there is greater uncertainty in the trend estimates than, than you get from just quoting the, the linear fit uh, trend standard deviation. And this is something I have to give credit to Ian Eisenman 
um, who I, I worked with published this, he led this study in, uh, in the cryosphere in 2014 that noted this. Um, and um, when you look at, when you're looking at small trends like in the Arctic, which are you know, positive, but quite near zero, um, these subtle differences can make a difference in, in um, and particularly in your statistical significance and, and whether these trends are, are significant or not. Um, the NASA team, like I said, the summer melt bias, and that may be affecting the trend estimates. I do want to mention that there are other products that provide a high quality climate data record level um, estimates of sea ice concentration and, and long-term trends, most notably the OCSAF, the, OCE, the, the European Ocean and Sea Ice Satellite Application Facility, and their, their CCI, their Climate Change Initiative products um, that uh, I'd like to compare in the future. Um, here I focus just on the NSIDC products, but I think it's important to also, you know, the more products we look at um, and the compare as in an ensemble sense, I think the better. Um, and I think the regional analysis uh, provides some interesting insights. I think that's something I, I wanna look into more, um, but uh, cause there are some perks with those. Um, but uh, I think overall uh, they, they, you know, they, they largely follow the hemispheric results. Um, I do wanna, before I finish, acknowledge um, the DAC passive microwave team um, that, that produces the, uh, produces and archives and manages um, the, uh, the, the NASA products, the NASA team and bootstrap DAC products, uh, led by Donna Scott, and then um, Scott Stewart, Jessica Calm, Hannah Wilcox, Molly Hardman, Lisa Booker, Amy Gilliland, Ellen Bardo Gilles, Giles, sorry if I mispronounced that, um, and there's others. I, I apologize if I forgot some, and people have moved on to the team and off the team, um, but all do really great work to support the, the product. And then the NOAA team, uh, Florence Fetter, who's the lead for the NOAA team, and Wynn Nagel, um, who, who really led the and has led the CDR um, production and development. Um, and Scott Stewart, Scott Lewis, Trey Stafford, Matt Fisher. Again, there are others that I, I may be forgetting or that have been on the team in the past. Um, so I want to acknowledge them. And then um, finally, you know, the, the, the products are, are provided here, the NASA team, the bootstrap, the climate data record product. These are all available at, at, at NSIDC. And I also uh, mentioned a, a forthcoming journal article, which I basically summarized a lot of here. Um, this is an uh, currently under revision in uh, the journal remote sensing. So it should be coming out fairly soon. Um, and so with that, I will finish and hopefully leave a little bit of time for a few questions, if anyone has any. Uh, well, this is Florence. There's a question in the chat from Siri Joda. I'll let you answer and maybe add a few words after you're through. Okay, oh yes, I see the chat. Um, yeah, thanks, Sarah Joda. Sarah Joda uh, mentions active microwave data, such as radar, um, been used to rigorously compare the relative accuracy of the past microwave products. And yes, um, there, there's been a lot of validation studies. I didn't go into those here. Um, and those are particularly done by using uh, higher resolution uh, and independent data, such as visible, like for example, MODIS, beers and the past ABHR Landsat, um, which is high resolution. Um, and you compare, you know, using that high resolution and, and the different characteristics in the visible or infrared range can give you uh, a, a useful way to, uh, to really evaluate the different products and, 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 uh, and validate them. And radar, particularly synthetic aperture radar, SAR is another really valuable source for that um, particularly because SAR um, is, is, uh, works up through clouds. So visible and infrared, you're limited by clouds. It also works in the winter time uh, when there's no sun. And so SAR has been used quite a bit for, for validation. Um, it hasn't been used, um, you know, it's kind of used in validation case studies, getting various SAR data um, in selected regions, selected SAR scenes, and comparing the ice edge or the concentration um, but SAR has been pretty limited in its coverage. It's, it's a little bit more difficult to work with and interpret. Um, it doesn't have the full coverage uh, in the past. And so it hasn't been used in kind of more of the global hemispheric scale um, like I looked at here, but um, there is a lot more SAR data available now and, and more coming. There's things like Sentinel, um, the European Sentinel, uh, Sentinel-1 and so forth. And then the 
Canadian radar sat constellation mission, um, which is a series of, of SAR uh, sensors that will give you pretty pretty close to uh, hemispheric coverage um, um, over the ice covered regions um, every day. And there's also the NASA NISAR, um, which is which will be launched here in the next year or so, um, that will provide coverage less so in the Arctic. Um, uh, but still we'll probably get near the ice edge for a, a good chunk of the year because the Arctic coverage isn't as great, but uh, particularly in the Antarctic as well. So SAR is a, is a really great um, resource that I think is going to get used more and more um, in the coming years um, as we get more data and also being able to better manage the, the, the volumes of the data, um, for example, in the cloud, um, because the data volumes for SAR are so, are so large that it's difficult to, uh, to, to use um, uh, uh, you know, on one's own computer. <laughs> and Sir Jota, yeah, you mentioned it can help refine the passive microwave algorithm. So that's certainly a, a potential there, um, you know, using um, using the, the SAR data to better um, either provide combined products or and, and or uh, tune and adjust the, uh, the algorithms to, uh, to, to uh, improve them using the SAR data. Well, do you see the next thing in the chat? Yeah, so the, the NASA team data from both version one and two and then NASA team now, the, right now NASA team really is, is a version one. Um, the algorithm actually hasn't changed um, in any particular uh, way um, since its original, um, since its original um, development. Um, it's, uh, it uses it, the same type of, it's constant coefficients, different coefficients for different sensors. Um, and so that's one of the things with the NASA team. It has this heritage um, that's very consistent over time. The bootstrap has undergone uh, more revisions. Um, the, the later versions of the NASA team are really just versions in the data packaging uh, more than anything. Um, and so um, like the, the near real time version two. Um, and so, uh, you know, so the NASA team really has not changed. The bootstrap has changed. It's on version three. There's been changes in how it does these coefficients and some other aspects. Um, in the in the CDR, like I said, is now on version four. And uh, uh, Robert Grumbine Bob, uh, I, Bob uh, mentions the team too, which I didn't get into here. Another algorithm. It's called the NASA Team 2 algorithm. Um, and, uh, and that's been used for, for example, for the AMSR products um, that we have at NSIDC at, within the DAC. Um, the the AMSR is a, is a high resolution sensor um, and it, 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 it gives really high quality data, but it doesn't have the length of record. Um, and it's because it's higher resolution, it's a little more difficult to, to uh, connect to the um, to the older legacy products from SIMR and SSMI and SSMIS, but that is something that we're actually looking at um, how to take advantage of that. Um, and NASA Team Two was developed for AMSR for AMSR E um, back, which was launched in 2002, um, and specifically to try to address some of the deficiencies in the NASA Team, the melt, and particularly in the Antarctic. Um, and it's a very different algorithm than the NASA Team. I won't go into the details here, um, but I think it is good to mention for folks that um, do come across it, even though it's called NASA Team 2, um, it's really a, a completely different algorithm in many respects. It, it uses um, it uses the ratios, but it, it, it uses also an, an inversion method and in, in, um, in a, um, a process It uses um, atmospheric uh, correction and atmospheric uh, inverse modeling to give you um, to it, to uh, to give you the the concentrations and an iterative method to kind of match the observed with a modeled um, modeled um, atmospheric um, estimate. And so yeah, it's quite a bit different, um, and we haven't used it in this product uh, in these products here, but it is used for the amateur product. Are there any other questions? Yeah, yeah, this is Florence. I guess this is a question more for um, 
anybody from user services who's on online. And I'm just wondering how we uh, we NSIDC talk to the, the public about these various products or uh, you know ways of ways of doing that. Um, and that's not a question for Walt so much, although I'm sure he has something to contribute on that score. Um, maybe it's just something to think about. Yeah, I think I don't know if there's someone from USO that user services that wants to chime in. Um, I think that um, you know my experience is that that certainly you know these products are are have distinct differences. Um, they are all I would say high quality um, and and provide useful trends. I think I've hopefully shown that in my presentation. But there can be confusion uh, with users between the products, um, and uh, you definitely you know don't want to mix and match products um, between them. You want to use a consistent product when uh, looking at especially long term changes. Um, so um, I, I've run across you know various confusion at times, um, and I think uh, I think the user services we try to do a good job um, of distinguishing these, um, and we do have some documentation that um, talks about the differences between the NASA team and Bootstrap in particular. In particular, um, but I, I think that's always going to be an issue with multiple products like this. Um, so yeah, I don't know if anyone from the user services is on that wants to chime in. Um, but that would be my my comment on it. Um, yeah, this is Jenny from User Services. Um, I'll just add that we do get questions about like which product to use. And often we will ask Walt for his advice because it depends on what the user wants to do. Um, but I agree, it's definitely something we need to think about maybe in terms of like beefing up our documentation um, so we can like reference or send users that way. So we have something um, in a bit more detail, but yeah, I think for the moment we we do just um, rely on Walt's um, expertise. Thanks. Um, there, there's another question in the chat um, from Guofeng Kao, um, and uh, that is there a way to measure or estimate the volume of the sea ice? Um, really great question. Um, we uh, we do have at NSIDC uh, within the within the DAC now we have ice data and ISAT two that's altimetry data laser altimetry data um, we also actually have a, a version of the radar altimetry from Cryosat two which is a, a, a European satellite um, and that's measuring the the height of the ice um, and and the the height of the freeboard the height above the waterline and from that we can we can derive thickness. And estimate thickness and then from the thickness with the concentration we can potentially get volume um, there's a lot of issues with that there's snow cover on the ice there's the uncertainty in the in the uh, altimetry estimate um, so there are challenges with that but uh, it is possible to do um, there is some possibility of doing it with passive microwave as well um, particularly uh, lower frequency channels um, that are available on some of the satellites like seven gigahertz um, Song Mu Li, who, who was uh, from, from uh, University of uh, University of Seoul, um, who's been a postdoc here at the University of Colorado, I worked with, uh, has done some really nice work. Um, if you look for some of his pro some of his recent papers, um, looking at thickness using this kind of the the emissivity and scattering of the signal in different channels to try to get a sense of the the freeboard and then deriving the the thickness. Basically, what all these do is, is measuring the freeboard, the height above the, the waterline, and then the thickness is derived based on using, uh, based on the density of the ice and some assumptions or data on the snow and, and the density of the snow to get you the thickness. Um, so it is possible to do that, um, particularly with altimeters, um, potentially, at least to some degree, with passive microwave. Um, but it but it is a challenge. Um, there are some products that are coming out um, that do this, but um, there there are still pretty good pretty big uncertainties with those. And we don't have the long climate records um, with that because of the altimetry really had, didn't get going as far as good coverage until the early two thousands. Um, and really, it's only in about the last ten years that we really had good complete coverage, um, at least through the winter time. Altimetry uh, is pretty limited during the summer. Um, and, and also the passive microwave due to the, due to the melt. But uh, winter thickness from roughly October into April um, 
is is possible um, in the Arctic. I should comment here. Um, the Antarctic is trickier. The ice is different. A lot of snow, and so um, Antarctic uh, thickness is is something that still people are aiming and looking into that. But um, there's really not much on that yet. But the Arctic, there is things coming. So thanks.